The internet and other technologies allow the governing body to serve the brotherhood in ways not possible just a few years ago. The tools may be new, but the work is not. In our next segment, we'll learn what past members of the governing body did to stay connected with and serve Jehovah's people everywhere. The governing body has always felt a keen responsibility to live up to Jesus' command, feed my lambs, shepherd my little sheep. Today's technology makes the governing body feel like family. But did the worldwide brotherhood in times past enjoy such a strong bond with the governing body? Their heart was in the preaching work. I can speak from my own experience that the missionaries were very close to Brother Nord's heart. So after sending them first to Latin America, he was eager to see their progress. And so he visited them. And then over the years, he traveled the world and he visited as many missionary homes as he possibly could. He privately met each missionary personally to talk over their challenges, to arrange for better accommodations if needed, to assess the potential for growth, or even to establish a new branch or arrange to purchase new property if needed. Brother Knorr loved the Brotherhood, especially missionaries and branch personnel. And he would take an opportunity of a 15 or 20 minute stopover in a train station or at an airport to give encouragement or to help them to advance the preaching work. Brother Nor visited all of the branches to encourage the brothers, and he talked with the missionaries. But in the 1950s, there was much growth, and that proved to be too much for him alone. So he decided that it would be appropriate to train uh, some of us brothers so that we could assist in that work and uh, see that the shepherding is done and that the work in the branches is done in unity. I want you to just have fresh in your mind the words that you've just heard from Richard Kelsey, who is in CELTAS, the Central European branch. We just heard him say, but in the 1950s, there was much growth, and that proved to be too much for him alone. But in the 1950s, there was much growth, and that proved to be too much for him alone. Who's him? Who's this him we're talking about? We're talking about Nathan Knorr. And the point I'm making here is that this segment is titled The Governing Body Preserves Unity. Not Nathan Knorr Preserves Unity. Not the president of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania preserves unity, but the governing body preserves unity. They're doing it again. They're rewriting their history and pushing this narrative that there has always been a governing body. There was a governing body in Bible times, not true. <laughs> again, the term governing body doesn't appear in the Bible. There was a governing body in the 1950s. Here's a picture, and if Tibor is gracious, you'll see the graphic that appears at the beginning of this segment. The governing body preserves unity. And what they've done is very clever. They've taken quite a famous picture that dates to the 1950s, of the directors of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. Here is the same picture, but as it really appears. And what you'll hopefully see straight away is that there's an individual on a much nicer chair than the rest. <laughs> there's an individual indeed in the center of the photograph, sat behind a desk on his leather chair. It's Nathan Knorr. He is the president, and he is surrounded by his directors, by the directors of the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of Pennsylvania. It wasn't 
a governing body. You can see the trickery. They accuse us apostates of trickery. <laughs> they accuse us of twisting things, of lying, of trying to twist the truth. They've literally photoshopped this image so that it looks more like a governing body. When the reality is that this photograph was taken before the governing body existed. And that's not to say that you can't find the phrase governing body in Jehovah's Witness literature going as far back as the 1940s. Again, it's a corporate term that snuck into the writing of the organization around that time. But it didn't become a reality until the 1970s. Those are just the facts. Pre-1970s, specifically 1975, was when the governing body as we know it today was born. Pre-1970s, it was a presidency. The president ran things. The president pulled the strings. The president decided how things were done. And the directors advised him and rubber-stamped his decisions. That's how the organization worked. But it doesn't suit the narrative of the organization. They want Jehovah's Witnesses to think that there's always been a governing body. The way things are done now is pretty much the way things were done in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s. Not true. And what's interesting is when you interview older members, older figures from the organization's hierarchy who are still in circulation, such as Richard Kelsey, they can't help but tell it like it is. They cannot help but talk about the organization in terms of Nathan Knorr being the one who made all the decisions. And that's why you heard Richard Kelsey say earlier... But in the 1950s, there was much growth, and that proved to be too much for him alone. It was Nathan Knorr alone who was running things, who was steering the ship. It was a presidency. The cult had a single leader, whereas now... It has multiple leaders. And as with any cult, when it comes to pushing the organization's agenda, when it comes to pushing their narrative, facts and the truth fly out of the window, even to the extent where history ends up getting rewritten. 